Okay, and with that we start. Um, so, welcome to our Cooking 101 class. <laughs> I know you are all here to do some nice beignets and uh, other local New Orleans food. Um, um, so, it, uh, what? The Drupalcon? Uh, it's the wrong <laughs> convention I'm in? Okay. Um, yeah, no, this is the future of Drupal Performance Parallel Worlds, but we'll do some cooking today, and you'll soon see why. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Fabian France. It would be great if you tweet something, if you would mention me, or use some special hashtag. We can find future Drupal or something like that. And yeah, so um, let's start with a little introduction. Website composing is really like cooking. We are cooking a website. And uh, that means not the development of a website, but actually a page request. Like you are going to some URL like Google or whatever, or Drupal.org, and Drupal in the background is composing all this stuff together, like different things. And that's, in a way, it can be compared to cooking. It's because we have di different little ingredients uh, that we're using. Uh, which are kind of our content. Then we have cooking utilities that are helping to assemble this current content. And we have other things like a can opener, which is like authorization. And then we have obviously cooks doing the work and preparing the meals. So, but there is only one cook in Drupal. And that gives some problem because that one has to wait a lot. And let me demonstrate that to you a little. So that was visualization of latency. How <laughs> latency works, how uh, it really makes problems, and how even with caching there still is some latency. Still have to run over there to get that. And the other thing is we are sometimes getting the can opener to open the cream, even if the meal doesn't even have cream, so we don't need the can opener, but we are getting the can opener every single time. And often it's like we run into the cellar to get the can opener every single time, regardless if we need it or not. And that's a lot of unnecessary work. So as I said, no one would run a kitchen like that. You would first have several cooks, so if there's even an ingredient missing, someone else would keep steering so that the meal is continuing, someone else would get the ingredient. And you would not put your dish to the side and run to the supermarket to get the ingredients. You would plan that a lot more better. And while someone else gets the salt for you, you would preserve, prepare the dessert already. So that meal is blocked. You cannot continue with it. But you could do some desserts meanwhile. Like Drupal could render the footer while the database is still busy because the footer might be cached. We could send it already. And that's also where the big pipe work comes in, kind of that uh, whatever is ready, we are sending. It's like a restaurant uh, where you order a huge menu, but it doesn't get in order, and you don't really care because you're really hungry. So whatever gets ready, you are eating. Um, and as I said, you would not get the can open out of the cellar every time especially not when you don't even need it. But Drupal is kind of doing all of that every request. 
Because we load the service container, we load so, so, so many classes. We have to load them all again, and we have to compile them, and PHP has to initialize them, and we have 242 services or something like that. So uh, it is a lot. And then we run always, that's kind of our bootstrap process, we run the session initialization, we run the authorization, we run the routing, and just then we can even start delivering a web page every time. So we always start from zero. We are caching a lot, and in Drupal 8 even more, but we kind of always start from zero um, to, to do all of that. Uh, so we always start from zero with our meals. There's nothing prepared already. There's no ready-made dishes in the, in the refrigerator. But that in itself is not bad. It's just how the CGI model works, where you have a web server which is accepting your requests and which is passing them on to a CGI, like a PHP FPM or a mod PHP or whatever. This is kind of how our world works. But this is not how, for example, the Node.js work works. And it just means we do potentially very unnecessary work. And it just means we wait for I.O. a lot, especially with PHP 7. And there's no way to have multiple cooks right now. It's really just me running around all the room and getting the ingredients. And yeah. And now we're coming to that. Um, how do we fix it? Um, and that's um, the next step. So are you ready for some really cool ideas? Um, I hope you are. Then let's go. So at DrupalCon Amsterdam 2014, my render cache session, I shared my vision about how this render caching could, work, could all work. And the only thing Drupal 8 at that point had was cache tags. And it was a little crazy overall, in a way. But by now, 90% of all that is implemented in core. Directly shipped, big pipe in core, 8.1, uh, the placeholders in core, everything. So I'm just trying that again. <laughs> So the first thing is we need, really should try to avoid doing unnecessary work. So uh, one of my goals is to bring back kind of the performance of the Drupal 8 cache to the Drupal 7 level. And I've already shown it's possible. Um, there's a special issue, a meter page cache, uh, where I've profiled that and optimized kind of almost everything out of Symfony, everything out of the page cache, and then in the end, um, with some little tricks, we can be, it can be possible, plus keeping all the goodies of Drupal 8 to be faster than uh, Drupal 7. And because Drupal 8 is PHP 7 ready, we can even faster than Drupal 7. And so that's one of the goals. And the other thing is we now have this dynamic page cache, which is great for caching all the authenticated user page um, things. And we can bring that kind of to the index PHP level again, which means do it as quick as possible, do it as fast as possible, don't do much work, kind of just load the database, get the cache entry, check it, and be done. And yeah, and uh, for that we, um, my strategy or architecture I've designed is to use the same approach as um, how ESI would do authenticate user caching within Varnish. And that means we are caching the cache context. That sounds a little crazy, but it, um, it all makes sense if you um, now or remember that in Drupal 8, uh, the cache context, which is um, how your context, how you are content varies, like this context is only cacheable by user, but this context is only cacheable by the face of the moon, um, or by some crazy elven ritual that you're doing. Um, this um, cache context, uh, you can actually uh, reduce to two things. All of our cache context hierarchy is, is planned in a way that for simple sites and for more complex sites, you have to define some other things. Um, you have a tree. So we have URL, and then we have URL.pass, or we have user, and we have user.permissions. So everything in the end comes down to the user or to the URL, and the user in reality is just, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between a session and the user. So it all comes down to we have a session or we have a URL. 
And because of that, and because cache contexts actually declare what they are depending on, like other cache contexts, when they would be reduced in that way, um, it means uh, we can cache the cache context per session. And that's kind of also, also how it would work in ESI. You would do a quick restart. The user is then authorized within Varnish. And then with some special headers, Drupal can now, uh, this user has user ID too, et cetera. And now the idea is we're doing the exact same thing uh, just within Drupal itself and retrieve this page with the placeholders and that's, I'm explaining a little more now. So as an example, we have this shopping cart which is user cached. Then we have a normal block which is just user permissions cached and we have the user permissions and URL cached. So we don't really have to deal with a normal block because that we can just cache with the rest of the thing. That's not a problem. So, but the user cache obviously is a problem because if we didn't placeholder that, it would mean our whole page would be cacheable by user. And that's not what we want. So, what we store in the page cache, in the dynamic page cache, then, uh, then is we are storing our page together with the placeholder. But this placeholder actually has a cache address um, because it's cacheable. So, um, and uh, in this case, it's a block four, block with the ID four and the user of two. And this is even if you look at the database and you look at the cache IDs that are stored in the database, whenever you see a bracket, that's a cache context right there, user equals two. But because we have our little mapping that from the session 42, we know it's user two, and we already did this really quick up look into some cache uh, like a local APC cache or something like that because that's not really changing. Um, and um, we get back that this is user two, we can actually know which cache context we need without having to bootstrap all of Drupal or authorize the user um, by caching the cache context. And that means um, when we are now retrieving this, this page with the placeholders out of our cache, um, there's still some chairs here at the beginning, if you could come up in the front, if you want, not front. So if you are still um, retrieving this page with the placeholders, and we have this placeholder, and this placeholder is cached, then there's no reason why we need to bootstrap Drupal up even further, because we can directly compose the page. And um, that's kind of the, the trick here, and that's also what what is so great about authenticated user caching with Varnish, with NCDNs like Fastly, um, that you can be directly near the user and in the future even with service workers, you could be caching things at the client, directly at the client and it's always the same model. We are having dependencies that things are dependent on, we are having these cache contacts which are the dependencies and we are having placeholders for things that should be out of band kind of. And, um, and this is kind of the trick that we can do with an index PHP. We compose the page because it's all cached and we are done. We just send it. And the nice thing is with that architecture, both scales of Drupal profit at the same way. The small sites just get faster performance for free, kind of. And the enterprises sites get easier varnish and ESI. Um, so regardless which um, camp you are in, I, you will have profit. And all sites, um, because it's using the exact same mechanism, and we can write all the tests for kind of the ESI within Drupal itself, and then when there's real Varnish ESI, it just works because it's the exact same mechanism. There's nothing different about that. And, or if you use NGNX, you would write yourself a module that would do that. And all sites could get faster response times for cached fragments because we have a cache that's sitting so much at the front of Drupal that it's so early in the process that um, you don't have problems with that. And so with service workers, as I already said, um, which is kind of like a reverse proxy, like a varnish on the client itself, uh, we can use the same exact mechanism as with ESI. We can send the page with the fragments, and then we can display it, and then we can cache the other fragments separately. So um, the whole system kind of works for all, uh, all stages of that. And so without any additional work or changes in that, and it, for you as a developer, nothing changes. Um, so service workers would profit from that as well. 
And the nice thing is we can do what I have shown you almost today. There's kind of a five-line patch missing to Drupal kernel, uh, which means uh, to allow um, pre-container middleware support. So a Drupal uh, request works in the following way. Um, you are actually um, doing it like that, um, that um, the container is, um, the request is coming in, a kernel is created, and then we are going through a middleware chain. But unfortunately, before we do starting the middleware chain, because the middlewares are stored in the container, um, we have to load the container, and that is, even if we were loading it from APC, it's, it's still so much of an impact that it's um, slower than the Drupal 7 page cache was, and um, because the container is quite big, because it has all our services, even if they are not loaded. Um, but uh, because we have a bootstrap container, um, we can kind of hard code all of that in settings PHP, and we can have like would define pre-container middleware, and then we had true middleware support, or you could hack index PHP today to do that. Um, and um, with a pre-container middleware, you could still have like in the bootstrap container your database, your cache tag service, even re custom request policies for the page cache, even custom middlewares you want to really run always and you say, I don't need this additional performance, this middlewares need to run because they're doing essential things. Um, but then the page cache comes in and we can do all this composing and stuff. And we can add this little thing missing in any Drupal 8 major version, uh, minor version. <laughs> to truly cleanly realize this, the best would be, however, to um, remove bootstrapping completely, just have like middleverse as a system, remove HTTP kernel from Symfony, there are other ways possible, obviously, and lazy loaded services. That means the session initialization, authorization, routing, all of that where I had to go around the room is all done on demand. So just when, for example, the current user service is used, just then the user is authenticated. So we are going even more into a service-based architecture where things are done on demand and we are really, at every stage we know we can get into a booted up stage, but re um, depending on where we are standing currently, um, we have to do more work or less. Uh, so if all this cash, no work at all, but if little is cash, we need to do a little. And another thing we could do um, with this kind of model is we could even send the page skeleton already and then big pipe the main content as soon as we have it, like stream the main content too. And the vision of all of that, and that's so important to me, as this should be completely transparent to the developer and SEMA. There should be no intrusion at all, which means it's all backwards compatibility and which means it's all Drupal 8 possible. And the site should just get faster automatically and that's the goal. Obviously, you would still, as a developer, need to declare your dependencies properly, but you need to do this today uh, already. So it's not really something changing. But there's more. Um, be ready for the future. Because we have this great render tree in Drupal, um, trees have one great property. They're easily parallel parallelizable. <laughs> so whenever we encounter a new rendering context, and a rendering context is something that's cacheable, uh, which is independently buildable, so whenever we have something where we, in the end, when we come back from the tree rendering, would do a cache set, um, in this case, instead of rendering that directly, we just create a promise, we push that to a queue, replace it with a so-called wait placeholder and return. And then before sending the page, obviously we need to process the queue, um, but um, and that all would also work um, recursively. And then we'd have kind of like an event loop which processes that queue, for example, in Drupal standard just um, as a random worker, which would just randomize your order, and then fun begins. So, and obviously if you have a promise, like you have one part of the tree and then you are going down and there's something else in the tree, um, then this would also work recursively and then obviously if there's two things, one promise would need to wait on the other. But there's real big 
possibilities there. Because now, for example, with HHVM, you could just make an async queue runner instead. And then, like magic, we have asynchronous I.O. Kind of automatically. And because while we are waiting for the I.O., we can start rendering another independent fragment. And maybe that's all cached and never needs the database or it's just internal things. And um, this can um, uh, really help um, the performance of reducing our I.O. thing. Because as I said, with PHP 7, things have gone so much faster, but I.O. is starting to become a bottleneck again because of that. Yeah, and PHP 7 itself is in the process of implementing asynchronous I.O. as well. They've worked so hard in PHP 7 to have proper isolation levels and everything that it would work much when they have kind of prepared everything. So our estimation, um, what I've heard so far, is it might come in 7.4 or later. We'll see, but uh, estimations are, we are pretty sure it will come at some point. And or someone could base the queue runner based on React PHP or Icicle IO or whatever thing is hot next week. Um, <laughs> and in the future, we could have something other cool guaranteed response times, which is something that um, CEOs around the world are asking for since forever. Um, so, for example, you can say if this block takes longer than 50 milliseconds, that's our guaranteed response time for this block then just abort the rendering, throw away those 50 milliseconds, return a placeholder, a real placeholder in this case, uh, and big pipe it later. So uh, we could have a page and we can dynamically, intelligently determine um, this block here is, is this really taking way too long, something has gone wrong, abort, send a placeholder, we'll, we'll send it later when it's ready. And um, when we add this kind of, and, and even without truly asynchronous I.O., we could still already do something of that, like yielding back, going back, because we are dealing with trees. And as I said, trees can have many like these properties um, where we could just measure the time to render that tree. And if at that point we have already uh, gone over our limit, then we can say, oh, but now rendering the rest of the tree would take even longer, so now we are aborting kind of. So, that could happen in a subtree, for example, that we are uh, defining such guarantees. Uh, so that would not even need HHVM or asynchronous I.O. Would be more efficient, obviously, because, well, it could take hundreds milliseconds, um, and Signal obviously leaks, le needs PC and TL extension PHP. Um, but um, at least we could say, well, but now we don't want to wait the other 200 milliseconds that the rest would need. We've now gone over. That would not be guaranteed, but it would say once we are over and we are back in control at some point where we can set a placeholder, um, we really want to abort, and we can do that at any time. So if we add this kind of abstraction, then the implementation does not really matter at all, as I've shown. Uh, you can use a hard thing of the week, and uh, just more little explanations. Already tried that a little around the placeholders because it's 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 a term like context, where everyone is understanding something different about it, and um, it can be defined in so many ways. And that's why I used wait placeholders. Normal placeholders in Drupal are replaced as late as possible and they are cached because the reason we are placeholding is we want to remove dependencies like this tree being dependent on the current user. That's why we are doing a placeholder and kind of doing out of band rendering. Wait placeholders are different because they are replaced as early as possible and never cached. Because the only thing we want to do is we want to remove the waiting time. So wait placeholders have been replaced before a cache set happens. So and that's again why I'm saying it's completely transparent to the developer. There's nothing in there. And there's another nice property of the, our render cache tree because we have hash cache, and that can obviously return something cached. So whenever we have hash cache, we can safely return just markup and attachments um, because that would happen if we had to cache it. Um, and this is where we can do those replacements easily. And again, we could do this today. We would just need to replace the renderer in a module thanks to the decoupled architecture of Drupal 8 and play around with that. Isn't that exciting? 
I find this really exciting. Um, so the vision for Drupal 9 here would be that Drupal 9 would have at its heart an event loop like Node.js or Golang or whatever. And uh, again, we want this to be completely transparent to the developer or SEMA. It should just get faster automatically if capabilities are available. That's a go. And we could change Drupal 9 and learn as a community together uh, to be as much async as possible and switch over to the paradigms that most other languages have and win back those people that left for Node.js. <laughs> um, but there's even more. So workers everywhere. Because now that we have our nice little queues and things that are independently renderable, why not push the work to a dedicated rendering farm? For that, for that we need to know which theme we are in, which user we have, which session we have, which route, which URL. In short, we need to know the context how this should be rendered. But we do have this information because that's exactly how that context would be, our content would be cached and how that content varies. And that are our cache contexts, actually. And that you are hopefully all declaring anyway, if you're working with Drupal 8. And we would need a way to quickly set that context. That's not available right now because, as I said, we do all this bootstrapping stuff. You see, it's all coming together, the different parts. Um, but as soon as we have that defined, what we can then do is we can do pre-generation of content. So, for example, we could have a heuristic that was checking um, for our most hundred, hundred most active users. Uh, we are pre-generating content so they have a faster experience and um, have never to wait for anything. And um, our heuristic is just iterating the most used blocks, for example, or the most used content um, nightly, and then we can pre-generate it because we have the full context how we can pre-generate that content um, because we have that available and we can record that um, because we have a queue and we have independently built things. And that's why when you are building modules, use lazy builders. They're great. Um, and we can do regeneration and serving of stale content. So for example, remember our block we guaranteed the time for. We could either send a block that's kind of saying uh, timed out or we could send some stale content and once the new content is available, just send it. So there's, in, there's a huge potential in Drupal because we're never deleting caches at the moment uh, except for the database where we are adding some pseudo Last reason, least recently used things. Um, but in general, all things that are expiring where you get a cache miss, you can say, I want invalid content, and you can get, get the old content. And that's great. So uh, there's huge possibilities there as well to say, especially in combination with BigPipe, where you're saying, OK, um, I still have an old version of that. I send that. I don't care that the user sees a little blip in, in change like their, their list of friends. It's there. And then the order changes a little and some other friends appear like 100 milliseconds later, but the user directly has a fast experience. It's so much more important. And, um, or you could send the outdated content together with a special class which would gray it out so it's clear it would look like this. And that's a little then like Instagram, like those previews of the images where they are just sending the most um, major color already. And obviously, we could have workers in a rendering farm. But to make those workers efficient, however, we need long-running processes. And that in itself is a paradigm shift I'm proposing here. Because many things assume in Drupal that a request is short and everything is reloaded. And that's not the case for other systems, not the case for almost any other system. Um, so, um, but already now we have long-running Drush queue runners, uh, so it's not a completely new problem. Um, but we can do baby steps. And thanks to Quell's vision, thank you, Quell. He's here. Uh, some. Uh, most services we have are stateless and static is almost gone from the code base and that's so great because he worked so hard from Drupal 7 to 8 to make that a reality to change the community in ways to not only make it object-oriented programming that you might love or hate 
Um, but what all of this uh, gives us is it gives us possibilities to be ready for the future in that. And he made that happen since 2010, so that's amazing. And the rest we should put into a Drupal, and the rest kind of what we still have from static state, we just should put into a Drupal static service, in my opinion, so we could have some kind of scoped state or at least resettable state in the future. Because a Drupal static of Drupal 7 has one big advantage, you can just call Drupal static reset and your system state is again in a fresh state. But if lots of classes have different states, that's not so easily possible. So we could, for example, start as baby steps just with a loop in index.php that clears all static caches in between accepted work and actually we are needing that anyway for our unit testing because we don't really want state to have there. And uh, creates a new kernel every time, but at least then all the classes are loaded. And that's already is huge because the class loading overhead, why not much, it is something. Um, and HHVM, for example, does something similar. It has like a, like a warm up phase, and once it's warmed up, it knows the most frequently used classes and has those kind of preloaded in some special memory segment. Um, and then we could whitelist all the different services. Um, which already now are 100% stateless, thanks to Carl. Um, and for example, just create a container with just those services already preloaded. And then we just need to clone this container, and cloning is a really fast operation in PHP, and um, use that kind of as our baseline, and then just the services we don't have loaded yet, we have to load. But if that's still not enough, we can be even more crazy and declare cacheable metadata like cache context on the services itself. So if, for example, you have a worker, one for user one, one for user two, um, and you switch around and the worker has to one for user one, one for user two, then we could in theory just reuse the current user service, for example, but store it per user in a different cache bin. And again, this comes back to the model uh, that this kind of work that is coming in is coming in within a certain context, and a certain context, if we define this well enough, will be enough to determining all the dependencies of our system. So, and even more crazy, we could scope Drupal static with dependencies declared, so not the services itself, but the uh, caches of them, but that are just some ideas. And um, there's obviously some definitely raised conditions of static caches because if you have long running processes, that's something where if you have some cache you can run into cache race conditions, but as we said with Q runners you can run into the same race conditions already now. So, but it's just something to take into mind, and that's kind of kind of what I want to want to get into you now, or what I want to present to you now is is a paradigm shift that we stop thinking of websites as being request, response, and booting up everything, but we think of them as applications that are serving our users, that are serving our clients, and that we get all of that, that so many people are doing with JavaScript, that we get that in Drupal as one possible way to access the system, um, and we are building our system to be ready for that. Um, so to summarize that again, we need, and that's kind of the vision here for Drupal 9, we are setting and retrieving of the request context, we have long running workers and resettable caches and services. Um, and again, should be completely transparent, should just get automatically faster, that's a goal. Um, and that could be the promising future of Drupal, uh, future of the Drupal performance. But again, we could start today we can experiment with all that now. We should even experiment with that now because when the world is ready for asynchronous service workers, events loop, and finally going away from CGI for PHP, which I, pro I think will at one point in time happen because the whole other world is away from it, uh, then Drupal will be ready too. And that would be pretty sweet. Thank you. So now we have some uh, discussion because it's a core conversation. So uh, we can both ask questions in, um, if you didn't understand something, but we can also say, well, this is crap. You really shouldn't do this. Or um, no, we should do this differently or like that. We are the community, so um, fire away. M microphone, please. Hi. 
Um, so my question is with the long running processes, my understanding is that one of the barriers to that is, is that Apache is based on the short um, request response cycle. So how, how do we get around that if taking advantage of that would mean you know, major changes to what hosting options are available for the Drupal, Drupal ecosystem? You could talk to that. So first of all, as I said, I want a slow transition of everything. So uh, baby steps in that, that it's one possibility, but not the only one. So the boot everything up approach would still work. It would just be slower. So to make advantage of that, obviously, I think what will at one point happen and what has happened both for Golang and Node.js, et cetera, is that PHP will have a first class web server in itself. So you just run like you run a node process, you run a PHP process. Uh, that's one possibility, which is then having the big event loop and then um, retrieving directly requests, creating services out of that request and doing that. Another possibility is um, that uh, you have your normal Apache web server and you do even some of that uh, Drupal request uh, normally, um, but then you're pushing off work you either know and have declared to be a little longer running or other things, you're pushing that off to a Drush process. And there's uh, different servers, services available which might be performant. I've played around in 2009 with Gearman to do some really quick AJAX request for anonymous users, and that already was working pretty well because I got like 50 milliseconds response times uh, from that. So. Um, there are definitely possibilities in um, in using several of the other available queue systems, and obviously it's always a trade of how much infrastructure do we want? Do we want just to run a PHP process, something somewhere that that? Then obviously, what about all this plumbing that infrastructure guys hide, hate about Node.js that it's just one process and there's no, no one that checks that it's still running, etc. which we have for Apache. But um, I think that are all future questions and the important thing is kind of making Drupal ready that it can be run as an event loop, but not necessarily must. Okay, so I'm um, technical SEO by trade and my, uh, I kind of find my tagline being feed the bot, right? I want to feed the Google crawler. And I think some things that people need to understand is that Google, when it comes to your site, has a budget of time that it's going to spend crawling. So all of this that you're talking about, caching for the user or caching, I, it just is amazing to me. And thank you so much. And I, I hope maybe that's one of the baby steps <laughs> is, is to help, um, like if we serve a page that has um, related content, it would be fetching all that, even if the page is cached. But um, I really like where you're going with this. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Peter Willanen. Uh, just thinking about uh, your steps that maybe we could go for with Drupal 8, is there a way to use even the Drupal queue system and then couple some background processing? Uh, so I'm just wondering, we again need a system where we can basically use Drupal as is, where no background processing is possible, but uh, then accelerate it if it was, and have you thought about, is there a way we could use uh, Drupal queue? So basically your request would have to process its own queue entries if there's no worker, but if there is a worker in the background, then basically all that work would be done by the time it's needed. So um, yes and no, so I would not push that to a Drupal queue database backend because that would be too slow. Uh, it should be an in-memory queue by default. And then um, if you push it back to a worker that, um, and the in-memory queue should really work like a, um, and that's why I w wouldn't use it because um, I don't think that queue is particularly suited to that use case because what I really wanna have is these JavaScript or Gazelle or whatever abstracted promises where I'm, I'm really just having, when this is ready, just inform me kind of uh, of model. I don't care when it's ready, but when it's ready, give me the call back that you are now ready and then we can continue with that. And um, I don't think the Drupal queue is uh, suited to that, but on the other hand, for 
doing the workers and testing that out, um, obviously for uh, doing that, the Drupal queue could still be used together with a Drush queue runner. There would definitely be no problem. I doubt so that it would be for uh, many things would be um, uh, performant enough at the moment. But um, yeah, that's I'm more thinking of like a like a socket where we are posting posting the data because uh, most lazy builders and that's why you should use lazy builders are very small having declared the dependencies and then we just need to, to be as efficient as possible to um, declare our um, request context. And if you're doing that, it should be really simple payload that we're doing. But yeah, we could still do that all in Drupal 8. It would just be maybe some more needed layers. It could even be the same API for Q, but for that we would need to see if um, the Q API is sufficient for that. I'm Les Lim. Uh, I came in late, so apologies if you've covered this, but are there implications for debuggability for long ring processes or uh, across the entire system with several, with things that are, that are deferred to workers? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I've not yet thought about that in terms of how debuggable long running processes would be. I mean, in most cases, you would probably just attach your debugger normally in that. Um, so that should still work, but I've not thought about it. But um, my thing is obviously sometimes in development you would use it, but usually you would not. It would be more like a QA thing and it should be um, nothing that should interfere with your development usually because unless you want to specifically test that case. Okay. Uh, also sort of related to that, uh, profiling tools, um, are, are they have they caught up to the concept of having a long running process as well, functional? Uh, yes and no. So with XHProf, you can run XHProf disable at any point in time. You can rerun XHProf enable at any point in time. And that in theory should reset the state of that. Um, at least from my remembering of the code base of XHProf, when I run XHProf enable, it should reset all variables so you're starting new and can start at any point in time in the call stack. So that should be possible. And obviously, um, if you're using XHProf sample profiling, you could just write out some samples. But if it's not suited for long running processes, I don't think it would be very hard to change because it's really, um, I think there's like, um, five variables that you would need to reinitialize to get XHProf running, for example. Thanks. <laughs> Just want to build on the previous question and something you talked about uh, earlier, Fabian. If you're writing code that is proper stateless services and pure functions and so on, the big advantage is you can debug those independently of whether they're in an async environment or not. You can test them. Those will work the same way whether we do long running processes or async or native language async or whatever else. We want to have 90% of our code base written in such a way that we can figure out which one of these we actually want to use in three years, in five years, and do have three different three, two or three different versions of it. So, you know, write starting today, actually starting two years ago, write code that makes no assumption about its context or its runtime environment, and then it'll just work with any of these and you don't have to think about it again. That's the reason you write code that way, so that you are f flexible for all of these. Yeah, and stateless service means avoid static like the plague in your classes. Because while your, and, and, and your service should be recreatable at any point in time, kind of. You should, it's like writing iOS apps or Android apps where you can be suspended at any point in time and recreate it and the user just closes your application and you are responsible for holding all of that. But um, if you kind of, um, but you, there you also need to store, if you store state, store it in something consistent, which is in our case always the database. Next question. Discussion. <laughs> Some more cooking. <laughs> Does anyone disagree? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, well, can you please talk a little bit more on what can we do now in terms of uh, the initial initialization of the container service and all the stuff? As, I, I, as far as I remember, you reported in the issue queue that like now in Drupalate it takes about 100 milliseconds to make all those initialization. And in the, in the presentation you, you said that we can try to get rid of all of those uh, at all, but like kind of, we, are, are there any steps that we can try right, right now? So um, anything I've talked about, we can kind of try now. Um, to be more a little more practical, so currently dynamic page cache due to the design decision works with roots, but there's no problem in writing a middleware, um, uh, sorry, an, an event subscriber that runs before HTML subscriber um, that would store the page based on the root into something together with all the placeholders intact. So just push that into the cache. And then you just have to hack your index PHP and initialize your server, your database, and then you're just doing a query to that, grabbing that, and then you check uh, can you fulfill your, can you fulfill all the placeholders? And um, that would be a fun service to write, kind of, as a first step. And if you can, then just return the page and you are done. And then try it out and see how many security issues you get. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the, there is obviously a risk, especially for authenticated users. But on the other hand, you could have also uh, anonymous pages which are personalized. And I think we are even going into that direction more, more based on session. And how cool would it be if, if it's on session, but you know only this little part of your page is dependent on the session and you could still have a page cache that's running as fast as Drupal 7s and uh, you would still have your nicely personalized page and um, cache it for 10 seconds so only every hundreds request you have to actually boot up Drupal. So micro caching is also a hot topic that can be done. Or as I said with BigPipe we are keeping the request open, streaming everything else out already. So why not take the time after the user has everything and do some more work to regenerate some of the content you've just uh, delivered. Hot content in that. Next question. So obviously this is super exciting because of all the work we've done to enable this in Drupal 8. But the elephant in the room, the room for this is how do we still allow people to install the module on the live site? Anything that rebuilds the container is going to be very problematic for a long running process. So are we going to just leave it to the sites themselves to say, well, if you do that, you're going to have to do something about this, or are we going to have a front and back end? So um, let's say it like this. If you install a module and you have a request, let's say you have a slow page and you have some little callback that calls to some web service somewhere, and that web service happens to take 20 seconds today. So, and meanwhile, this request is serving this user, someone else compiles a container. We have that race condition today. So that's not a concern. For the long running thing, what we can use, um, and obviously that's another database hit, and that's where I really want to go, um, is atomic counting. Um, okay, the database is not as atomic, but it's atomic enough for our needs. Which means when we install a module, we are increasing a counter in the database. And then everything that was previously cached and everything is then outdated. We completely restart our long running process. And that's a way to synchronize that. And that's how uh, we use currently timestamps, but I would like to go away from that. Um, if you know, perhaps you know in Drupal there's a fast chain backend, which means um, you have the consistent backend, which is the database, and you have APC on several web heads, which is the inconsistent backend. And whenever there's any write, all the caches of that bin are invalidated because there's this timestamp in the database. But we can use the same model of versioning things uh, for many more things. And I do think when, we, when you're deploying code, you should increase your 
version identifier, then everything is automatically outdated. When you're enabling a module, we are increasing this counter and everything is automatically invalidated. And um, that's how, how I would approach that problem with atomic counting. It will be interesting to see it work in practice because as you're well aware, we had significant issues with the container and the module install because basically the whole Symfony panel is not built to make that type of change, like what code is loaded during your life cycle actually working. So I, th I, th I think you make it sound nice, but I think we then have to stop allowing modules to do certain things. So it's certain low level things like hooking it, like providing such middlewares that run before the container, we might have to stop them from doing that and then having something else, some form of low level thing that works separately outside of module installation. So so, so modules which don't have, aren't allowed to create database tables and stuff like that, but they just do these really, really low level things. Yes, for sure, um, especially if we want to officially, I mean, as a contract project, every site owner can decide if it's worth the risk or not, and they know which request policies they have defined in the container, and we could even warn and throw a big exception if there's a mismatch between bootstrap container and the other thing, but obviously there is some duplication that we are trading for the speed, and some modules wouldn't be able to do anything about it about that cache. But on the other hand, flexibility versus speed is always a trade-off in that. But yeah, I agree. If we do some constraints on that, it might be simpler to implement. Definitely. Hi, Mark Drummond again. Um, so this is, a, you know, some of the performance improvements are very, very compelling um, for how we can speed up the public side of the website. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we could apply that on the admin side of Drupal sites as well. My understanding is that the way things are working now, all the improvements we've made for caching and things, we're not really doing that on the admin side, which results in if you've got a, a fairly big Drupal site and you've got a fair number of modules installed, it can be a very, very very slow process of navigating the admin side of the website. So how can we take advantage of some of these things to make that part of working with Drupal a lot faster? Um, it's an interesting question, <laughs> obviously. Um, so the admin side has one big problem. There's usually a much more huge security concern about admin accessible pages and for other things. So even while we could, for example, cache such forms and even deliver them real fast, um, there are, I would be much more cautious in, in doing so and would, do, would at a maximum allow caching that site per URL and per session because everything else which is more granular, I would deem personally as too much as a security risk. Um, that said, however, uh, slowness on the admin side, there are several things um, in my experience. Uh, one is that sometimes there's unnecessary work, like, um, for example, a block is placed always somewhere, and it's placed in a region that does not exist, but then it was, in Drupal 7, sometimes blocks had been rendered um, because they were ex enabled for that theme, um, but, um, they weren't even there, uh, so it was just unnecessary work. So again, avoid doing the work. Um, and then the other thing, however, that I would like to see more is render caching of forms. And uh, tackling all that form stuff, and um, I would like to see this in a, again, kind of three-step process. Um, where, um, first of all, uh, we are changing our form things to be true objects, and we are making them also available, for example, to JavaScript to directly manipulate. So our widgets are no longer like things that are just there, but in the end, the form is just an array of objects. And every such object could much simpler be cached under certain conditions than the whole form. And also um, what we can do, and that's kind of the approach I think 
we've been designed to be working with Drupal 8 and 9 by now is we can introduce new layers, like we could introduce a new kind of form API, um, for example, having these widgets, or we have a new form API which has some restraints, and you cannot do certain things, but if you uh, follow those restraints, and if you, for example, register an URL for your form, or if you register a callback for your form, uh, then we can shortcut certain things, and we can cache your form, then we can do certain things. And with all the other things, it was a quite long process, but we can do the same for forms too. Forms are not uncacheable. Um, we've proven them in Drupal 7 to be cacheable even in Akamai. Um, and replacing such things that are dynamic just, just on the JavaScript side. Um, so it's possible, I know it's possible, uh, it's just work that needs to be done and someone being crazy enough to say, I really want to cache those forms and I'm just trying it out and there will be 30,000 test failures at the beginning, but um, I check every challenge I'm getting and then I'm, I'm seeing that. And as I said, there might be kind of like a new form class, cacheable form or something like that, um, which has certain restraints and has certain parameters in being cacheable because currently you could pass a node to a form as a parameter. How would you recreate that? It's impossible. So forms need to be lazy buildable, they need to be independently buildable, they need to have a clear defined input and output and a near defined, uh, clearly defined state uh, which is stored somewhere. And once you have kind of cleaned that up, and made it, then it's cacheable, and then the admin form, and probably forms are like 90% of all admin pages plus listings, um, and listings already have at least some views when they're caching, uh, so probably forms are the biggest chunk left, and um, we can tackle that. I feel like this would play really nice with like an Ajax based system where you could just jump right into your, your placeholder system and say give me this when you have it and you don't have to reload whole pages so like all the groundwork you're laying here could also be used for that kind of stuff. Yes, exactly. Um, so in Drupal 8 um, what you have available is a render strategy um, service. Um, which is by default a chained render strategy service, so you can just define your own render strategy, and you could just have a dummy block, and then you have like a like a render strategy uh, that's replacing that with an AJAX thing, and you're done, or with something purely rendered by JavaScript, and um, so you can define a custom render strategy that could even play with AJAX really nicely. Oh, and there's even something we forgot in Big Pipe in 8.1. I've um, talked with some people here at DrupalCon and um, told them, yeah, my initial prototype had a little more, and I was like explaining, it was like, oh, I totally forgot. Um, so, uh, for example, at the moment, a block is, when it's a placeholder, it's Big Pipe when Big Pipe is on. But what we can do now, nicely and easily, is we can just put in a cached render strategy. And for all the placeholders that are already cached when Big Pipe is on, we just replace it directly and not Big Pipe it. Why, if it's cached already, why should we defer the rendering of it? No need to. Yeah. And there's other really, really low hanging fruit in Drupal if you want to make Drupal 8 faster and don't want to tackle any of that complex stuff. There's some very, very low hanging fruit. At the moment we are doing, if you have a list of 10 blocks, we're doing a cache get for each. In Drupal 7 there's a cache get multiple on that. You can implement that today, any one of you can work on that. There's an issue for that in the queue and that could be a pretty nice performance chunk for free. The only reason neither me nor Vim has tackled that uh, is because we had been so busy of making all the changes that are BC breaking in the Drupal 8 cycle. And, but yeah, there's some low-hanging fruit that can give tremendous performance improvements just for free. And as I said, the placeholder system is not yet completely implemented how I originally envisioned it. Um, I even had it that something that's not a lazy builder could still be placeholder with some little tricks. <laughs> yeah, further questions?
And we, oh, I think time's up anyway, right? Okay, then thank you so much. <laughs> Tell me how it was. Have you evaluate the session, evaluate the cooking. Very good. Um, on your website, do you blog about these topics? Sometimes, okay. very, very seldom. All right, but I got yeah, you. Yeah. I'll check it out. But very interesting.